taking and bold and they were back the unknowns had centered their activity near the massive volcanoes the sleeping woman Istashutl, and the sleeping sentinel Popocatepetl which was now awakening they had hovered over Puebla placing the fourth largest city in Mexico on another UFO alert The nightly aerial displays moved to the northwest over the world's largest metropolis, Mexico City. In a sleepy village north of Mexico City, barking dogs attract the attention of a father and a son who enter the night to investigate. Spotting a silent, stationary aircraft above the street lights they position their camcorder and zoom towards it. This unknown was unlike anything seen before. A unique ring of lights positioned around an invisible hull. The Mexicans were becoming accustomed to seeing strange objects over their city, like this unusual craft that was videotaped by Arturo Diaz Solano at 10 a.m. in May of 1992. Utilizing split screen, the two segments were placed side by side for comparative analysis. Were these video recordings of the same ship, or were they two similar objects operating over the same territory? With each new video came more questions and answers. The unknowns had once again captured the attention of Mexico's population and media by reinforcing their presence over Mexico City in June of 1992. Afternoon sightings were being recorded by camcorder clocks on a regular basis. Thank you. 
At times, their flight characteristics defied common logic and modern physics. Sometimes they simply strolled along the air corridors over this sprawling city, demonstrating their aerial prowess in a somewhat playful manner as they played peekaboo among the billowing clouds. Once again, in real time. Sometimes they came in low, and when they banked, they reflected the brilliance of the afternoon sun. Defining the reason why the ancient Romans referred to them as flying shields. On Monday, June 1st, this unidentified flying object, UFO, known in Spanish-speaking countries as an OVNI, flew through the valley of Atusco, near the power stations and transmission lines. Nearby, another OVNI made low-level runs over the various rooftops, marking this as a special day in UFO research because two videotapes and three 35-millimeter photographs were taken by four people in four separate locations of this vast country. A young artist, Hector Carranza, took these spectacular 35 millimeter photographs of a disc shaped object. At an area known as Las Layas, near the city of Santiago, Tehuantepec, people were seeing a car race at an automobile track. There is a forested area in the background. Many people saw and tell of seeing a silver-colored disc heading in the direction of the trees. It was Sunday, March 22, 1992. There were many witnesses. It was a hot, cloudless day. Between 8.30 and 9 a.m., people described seeing three colored lights. They were seeing something coming and going in a horizontal movement. They also moved upward in a manner that cannot be attributed to a airplane or helicopter. After 20 or 30 minutes, they left in the direction of the forest. People who saw them with binoculars, I didn't, described them this way. Eight months earlier, during the second wave of UFO activity, centered in the heart of the volcano zone, a university professor took this incredible photograph of an unidentified object. It appears to have lights within portholes ringing its structure.
the young artist's rendering took on new meaning. The similarities were amazing. taken during the same time frame in the same area of Mexico. During a drug stakeout, police commandante Larios Cruz took photographs of what was thought to be a low-flying DC-3. Taken on different dates, these photographs of apparent solid objects refute the many aberrations normally attributed to UFO sightings. Something unknown to human understanding was clearly operating in Mexican airspace. The parade of OVNIs accelerated over Mexico City during June of 1992. The people, encouraged by an open press and popular radio and television shows, trained their camcorders skyward with incredible results. On June 12th, an unknown is tracked headed northeast. And once again, the object demonstrates an unusual flight pattern we have seen before. Stopping in midair, reversing itself, then continuing on. New Skywatch groups, armed with binoculars and camcorders, anxiously waited as an amazing story began to unfold. Centering on one patient man, who was producing an abundance of extraordinary video. His afternoon breaks were spent atop an office building where he scanned the murky skies above the city, searching for and finding the unique flight characteristics of the unknowns. Demetrio Feria's keen eye and diligence had paid off. By the end of June, he had taken nine videotapes of unidentified flying objects. In this segment, shot on June 25th, the unidentified object appears to be rotating at 90 degrees. Note, the top of the object changing from white to black, white to black, as it rapidly moves through the cloudy sky. Two days later, on June 27, the OVNIs reappear over Mexico City. Again on June 28, and again on June 29. June 1992 had been a spectacular month for both sightings and video recordings. 14 videotapes and four 35 millimeter photographs were taken, making this the second most prolific time of the ongoing aerial show taking place over Mexico's capital city. The UFOs over Mexico were etching an important place in the history of ufology. But why Mexico? Why now? To search for an answer to this question, we must return to the past, July 11, 1991, and re-examine a 1,200-year-old prophecy. In 755 AD, Maya priests recorded their legacy in a prophetic message found on the Dresda Kadas, one of the remaining records of the great Maya. The prophecy states that a new son, a tiger son, would be born on July 11, 1991, and that this son, which modern day astronomers refer to as a solar eclipse, would usher in two life altering events for mankind, earth changes, and cosmic awareness, which was to be brought about by encounters with the masters of the stars. South of Mexico City, in the Zona Volcanica, on the slopes of Mount Popocatépetl, a climbing team notices a bright light of unexplained origin.
they send a radio transmission to their base camp. The first sighting of this historic day had been duly recorded. Throughout the path of the eclipse, scientists calibrated their instruments. As the hour of the eclipse neared, people throughout the sprawling city positioned themselves for the heavenly event to begin. This had been prophesied by their ancestors. This was the sixth sun. This was the son of Quetzalcoatl, the legendary god that vowed to return. The sixth este sun, nuevo sol. the new sun, Significa signified by the great eclipse that, that just occurred, speaks of an opening of knowledge. The sixth sun indicates, indicates precisely the moment of its arrival. The visitors from time were prompt. On July 11th, 1991, when all of Mexico seemed to be looking up, the first wave arrived. In sleek, silvery chariots that reflected the sunlight. Exactly at the time of the full solar eclipse, a disc-shaped craft appears over the city, hovers for over 30 minutes. 17 people on the ground recorded it on home video, and that's never happened before in the history of ufology. Because of the camcorder, the July 11th events would initiate the most documented UFO flap in history. Jaime Maussan, one of the most respected television journalists in Mexico, hosts the Mexican version of 60 Minutes. Jaime was so intrigued by the events, and especially the footage, that he enlisted the high-tech electronics of the Network for Digital Enlargement work to study this mysterious craft. We're talking about uh, a solid object, mm -hmm. um, apparently metallic, Mm -hmm. and that is apparently suspended there and there is nothing else we checked if there were balloons on the area there are not balloons there were not helicopters over mexico city or anything else but we think it's something big because it happened during a total solar eclipse the most important probably of this century at televisa studios the six best videos taken during the solar eclipse are put through comparative analysis. All are disc-shaped, structured, metallic objects that reflect light. The masters of the stars could not have planned it better. At a time when eyes were all cast to the sky, 17 different people in different quadrants of Mexico City videotaped an object, a classic flying saucer, suspended in air and floating, perhaps rotating on its own axis. In the city of Puebla, 85 miles southeast of Mexico City, three videotapes were taken during the eclipse. Each has its own special characteristics. In this segment, taken by Rafael Gonzalez, a ship is detected flying off screen to the right of the eclipsing sun. As Raphael pans to his left, he is attracted to a bright object and two other objects in the background. In freeze frame, we can clearly see three unknowns, but most importantly, the brightest of the three is obviously not a star, as we can see cloud formations passing in the background. With the crowd cheering, Dr. Cuatl takes his second segment of video over Puebla. Once again, the bright object appears to be in front of the cloud cover. Meanwhile, in the city of Puebla, the Breton family sees more than they were prepared for, as this home video demonstrates. This silvery disc was recorded at 1.22 p.m., approximately 85 miles from the location where Mr. Araguin took similar footage during the same time frame. Split screen is used to compare the segments taken by Araguin in Mexico City and Breton in Puebla. The two spacecraft correspond in size and shape. The third city that recorded UFOs during the solar eclipse was Oaxaca, 
316 miles southeast of Mexico City. Dr. Irv Trujillo shot this segment one minute before the full eclipse. The faults in this video are from the original tape. It is 1.30 p.m. and the sun is in full eclipse. It is now six minutes after the total eclipse and the unknown object is still clearly defined in full daylight. The time on the camcorder indicates that the object hovered over Oaxaca for a minimum of eight minutes. Throughout the duration of the eclipse, digital clocks on the video recorders provided a detailed record of events that substantiated the multi-ship theory. Dr. Trujillo recorded this object over Oaxaca at 1.29 p.m. While 254 miles to the northwest over Puebla, Rafael Gonzalez recorded both of these segments at 1.29 p.m. And at the same time, David Alamia took this footage over Mexico City. Camcorder clocks also documented the longest sighting, some 21 minutes. This was recorded by 16-year-old Eric Aguilar from his family's rooftop in Mexico City. The clock reads 1.04 p.m. This is the beginning. 1 1.14, 1 1.20, 1.25 .20, at the end, a total of 21 minutes had elapsed while the OVNI remained visible. The solar eclipse only lasted for 6 minutes 54 seconds which means that the object was visible for 14 minutes in bright sunlight. This rules out the Venus theory postulated by some. In a quest for answers, we took the Aragin footage into an image analysis lab. The Anovian computer is a powerful and dedicated image process station which excels in examining video in its rawest form. We were careful not to examine the blow-up work which was done digitally by Televisa, eliminating possible video artifacts that might be created electronically. Instead, we focused our attention on the original segment of the Adagin footage, which was only eight seconds in length. Okay, what we've got is we've loaded your Adagin footage into the Anovion uh, BGS-3, and up here at the top are six sequential frames of the video footage. They appear down here blown up times five, uh, frames one through six down here in the bottom. Take one of these and zoom in on it even more. We can go up here to times eight. We position where we, what we'd like to zoom in on and when we click on it, we're now looking at times eight of that particular image. Since it was so far away from the camera, we only have four lines of scan that hit the actual image sensor in the camera. Those four lines right there, that's all that picked it up. And this over here appears to be very, very black, which is abnormal, and it shows us, and most likely, that this object was illuminated from this axis over here uh, this is a shadow from the sunlight. The best you come up with is kind of the hockey puck looking uh, shape. The Anovian had challenged and eliminated the Venus theory on this piece of footage. The object recorded on video was elongated and shaped somewhat like a hockey puck. It was not spherical. 
Venus would display symmetrical pixel characteristics because it is a sphere. And our atmospheric clouds would not pass behind the planet, yet clouds obviously appear behind this object, and this object, and this one, all filmed during the great solar eclipse. For months, the Mexican airwaves crackled with the excitement and spirited debate on the subject matter of UFOs. Intellectual sparring matches erupted on popular television and radio programs. Some believed the age of awareness and enlightenment was upon us, while professional detractors argued that these mysterious craft were nothing more than anomalous objects. As the debate over the existence of extraterrestrials continued, a new witness came forward a Catholic priest, Padre Manuel Ferrar, who recorded this video during the solar eclipse. I believe there are a lot of possibilities. I came out to take a video of a pine tree against the light. When I came up, I saw the light appear over the mountain over there. It was not an ordinary light. It was blue and very intense. I have never been afraid of something like this. On the contrary, what I have been able to observe has been wonderful. Once a philosopher said, if God is outside of the truth, I will stay with the truth. So I feel there is no contradiction. 100 miles to the south, in the arid high desert near the city of Atlisco, the OVNIs were being seen, reported, and filmed on a regular basis. Unusual images had been photographed in the area of Mount Popocatepetl, the majestic volcano known as the Sleeping Sentinel. The population of Mexico had been captured by the excitement and curiosity created by the nightly aerial presentations. The second wave had begun. On the night of August 1, 1991, a dentist from Atlisco tracked an illuminated object silently moving above the city. When this footage is enlarged, what appears to be a formation of unknowns is revealed. The flurry of activity continued over Metepec and Atlisco, over Puebla. The night sky over Puebla had become the staging area for these unknowns. In this dramatic footage, two objects began to link up. While they are in the process of docking, two additional objects approach. We now have four unknowns that seem to be regrouping Then, all light sources vanish. When the light source reappears, the four unknowns have formed a tight formation. They then gain speed and altitude, banking to the left over at Lisco. They vanish into the night sky over the Zona de Vacanica, headed east towards the Gulf of Mexico. Reports of massive sightings started coming in from the state of Veracruz. In the city of Poza Rica, 20 schoolchildren artistically described their observation of a low-flying UFO, an experience that was validated by their teacher. Still more witnesses reported strange lights in the sky while others reported objects near the ground. But then, the evidence of OVNI activity took an unexpected spin. The sugarcane fields yielded seared and flattened areas, and Mexico had its first crop circles. Other witnesses reported strange objects over the states of Tabasco, Hidalgo, Tlaxcala, Puebla, Mexico District Federal, 
and again in the state of Veracruz. The cities most affected by the activity were at Lisco, Metepec, Puebla, Mexico City, Pachuca, Tulancingo, Poza Rica, Nanchtel, Veracruz, Acayucan, Cardenas, Toposlan. There are literally millions of people in the central corridor of Mexico that have seen these unidentified flying objects. This is the location of the country's greatest number of volcanoes and active seismic areas. Was it coincidence that this corridor was also in the path of the total solar eclipse of July 11, 1991? The celebration of Mexico's independence on September 16th is a national holiday replete with military parades and aerial displays of helicopters and Air Force jets in formation. Videotaping the event, Vicente Sanchez recorded an unidentified circular-shaped aircraft entering the scene from the right. As the 24 planes depart, the OVNI begins to slowly ascend Moments later, five of the Air Force planes break formation and give chase as the unidentified accelerates, leaving bewildered pilots in its wake. Optical enhancement clarifies the circular shape which greatly resembles the configurations photographed by Dr. Perez and Comandante Cruz. To rule out the possibility of a stray weather balloon, Mr. Jose Reyes of Mexico City's Meteorological Service agreed to release a balloon under controlled conditions with a camera crew present. Could this object be confused with a weather balloon in size, shape, and rotation? Only one balloon was launched September 16th, and that was at 6 a.m. The military parade was in the afternoon. In September and October, the skies over Mexico were becoming more and more crowded with unknown flying machines that seemed to be curiously drawn to their counterparts. In the span of one week, demonstrating their bravado, they made low-level runs through the high-rise corridor of the world's largest city by day and by night. On September 19th, Super Channel 3 in Puebla was swamped by telephone calls as an uninvited visitor appeared over their city. The bright red pulsating light attracted the attention of thousands of local citizens, creating traffic jams around the TV station which preempted local broadcast schedules and carried a live report of the event. On November 2nd, the base camp was able to record this nightly run of the unknowns. There was no let-up. On November 9th, an unidentified object is captured on video by a young student, Angel Cruz. This new ship appears to be rotating in a counterclockwise motion as it casually strolls through the skyline of Mexico City before disappearing behind an apartment complex. The object appears to be similar to this one that was filmed over Tepoztlan 
by Carlos Diaz. Utilizing split screen with blow-up work, we can compare the objects, which appear to be identical. In late February, the OVNI activity returned to the Zona de Volcanica over the besieged cities of Atlisco and Metepec. XHVP radio station became the control center for UFO reports flooding the area. Many of the sightings had centered around a pyramid-shaped mountain named Tetelotitla, the place in the heart of the gods. The station manager reported that over 90% of the people of Atlisco had seen UFOs and the other 10% knew about them. Front page news stories and photographs were common occurrences in this thriving city of over 100,000 inhabitants. The intensity of the OVNI activity over at Lisco had prompted the first UFO-related press conference to be held by an elected official in Mexico. When asked what the Mexican government's position on UFOs was, he replied, Neither the government nor the military feel threatened by the unknowns. We don't know what they are, but they do exist, and like everyone else, we are curious. So were the OVNIs. They seem to be strangely fascinated by the transmission towers, as depicted in this footage taken by Mr. Del Calejo from atop his apartment building overlooking the sprawl of Mexico City. H. David Froning, an aerospace consultant, speculates about the object's attraction to the transmission towers. We, in our own planetary explorations, are extremely interested in any energy patterns emitted from places or things. We might assume that other explorers could be interested in even the simple Hertzian waves that our radio transmitters emit. In this respect, getting closer would be better because signal strength is much greater closer in. And things such as amplitude and frequency modulations and beam patterns can be measured much more accurately in the so-called near field of antenna feeds. Thus, we might speculate that someone somewhere is adding to their database of electromagnetic signatures from various emitters on planet Earth. His attention focused on the object darting around the radio tower. Mr. Del Calejo continued to record as a commercial airliner approached. Then, as if guided by an intelligence that recognized the close proximity of the oncoming airliner, the OVNI moved out of the way. Another airliner approaches and it moves again. The possibility of onboard guidance, illustrated by unique flight characteristics, had been seen in numerous videos. In order to closely examine the aerial prowess of the UFOs, one of the most dramatic segments was loaded into the Inovian computer. He comes across the screen, he, he just abruptly stops and backs up and zips into the cloud, backs out of it, goes in again, peeks out, and goes out. Um, again, it's, it's, the motion is, uh, is not recognizable as that of an aircraft or a helicopter. During this computer examination, another remarkable discovery was revealed. So, I mean, yeah, right there. Go back Down there, there, right there. What is right that? There? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I haven't really looked at that before. That's Zoom in on it to see. Oh boy, it sure looks like a hockey puck kind of shape, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, I think you've just found a second optic. Too. Let's picture. Let's go back to the original shot. Okay. Now move the cursor down from that object we just examined. Let's go to the other object underneath it. See that right down there? Here? Yeah, let's see what we can find out about it. Something there. So we may right have a there. third object. Yes, you may. Yes, you may. Not only was the craft demonstrating flight capabilities unknown to modern physics, but there was more than one object in this footage and it dematerialized within a fraction of a second. Everybody's been watching him play peekaboo in and out of the cloud, and nobody's really paid much attention to down here. And that is definitely another object right there where the cursor is. Look how bright he is. Why is that? That frame. There, that frame there. And they go one more frame, one more frame, one more frame, one more frame. Look at that. You change brightness level. Then it drops right off in one frame, one one sixtieth of a second. That sucker changes intensity. Mm -hmm. Now we can fade out. The footage taken at Super Channel Three had exhibited this same one-frame appearance. While closely examining other videos with transmission towers in view, another startling anomaly was discovered. Something again appears and vanishes in one thirtieth of a second. Comparisons were made between the OVNI to the right and above the tower and the object that appeared to be near the tower. Surprisingly, the digital enlargement detailed the shading and pixel similarities between the two images. Given this unique ability to materialize and to vanish in an instant, and the remarkable aerial movements, one wonders if the UFOs are recognizing the attention they are being given, and are they reacting accordingly? These three teenagers think so, and the experience that they shared on a clear December night supports that possibility. Carlos Diaz was the first to notice a bright point of luminescence that not only appeared to be following them, but bathed their car in a brilliant beam of light. Arriving at a relative's house, the three scrambled to the roof to position a tripod and camcorder as they detailed this encounter to family and friends. To the amazement of all gathered on the roof, the object appeared to respond to thought and verbal commands as demonstrated in this home video. Wernaturo asked the object to move around two stars, which are identified here with red arrows. It did, not once, but numerous times. The public response to all of this activity was summed up by a man who has seen and recorded the OVNIs, Dr. Rosas. The people are definitely not nervous or afraid of the appearance of the UFOs. They actually like the idea and somehow find hope in the concept of extraterrestrial life and the reality of UFOs. Another who believed that the presence of the OVNI was not detrimental was Padre Ferrar, who filmed this from the roof of his small church. What makes this footage so unusual is the fact that this was the third video taken by Padre Ferrar in an 18-month period. But he was not the only one that had taken more than one video of the unknowns. Numerous others had had multiple sightings that had been recorded on videotape. But, of all the multiple sightings, none compared to Mr. Feria, who had taken dozens of videotapes of UFOs, including this fascinating footage taken shortly after the 1992 Independence Day Air Parade. Unlike the 91 air show, where the OVNI flew beneath the fighters, this UFO waited 10 minutes after their passing, 
before making its presence known. The unknowns above Mexico are objects of size, dimension, and mass that have been tracked by radar, and so far have seven distinct classifications. The first was seen during the eclipse. The second is a classic UFO shape. The third is a sphere that appears to have portals. The fourth is shaped like a top, the fifth has been labeled El Sombrero. The sixth is triangular. The seventh appears to be a luminescent, fast-moving object. And there may be others. But these classifications are not singular. For many have counterparts that have been seen in other locations around the globe. Two or more distinct classifications of UFOs had not been simultaneously videotaped until one autumn afternoon. Two luminous spheres are seen first. Then, as a dark object approaches from the right, the luminous sphere on the left begins to rapidly drop, allowing the dark object to sail between the two. Fifteen minutes later, the two luminous spheres are again almost horizontal, when this time a dark object flies beneath them. Digital enlargement provides additional definition for classification of the unknowns. A professional cameraman, Cuauhtémoc Alvarez, was filming a luminous sphere traveling across the horizon when he captured this unprecedented division of one object into two. Converting the image to black and white, we can clearly see the separation. The Alvarez footage was remarkable, but the most dramatic videotape of unknowns was taken by Mr. Icar and Mr. Trujillo. What would begin as a normal single sighting would soon develop into an extraordinary series of events. The cameraman and his friend are stunned. Words cannot describe what they are seeing and recording. It is unlike anything seen before, a transparent container with circular objects stacked inside. A flashing object appears below the container. This draws the cameraman's attention. He zooms back for distance reference. Two new ships catch his eye. There are now three ships in the viewfinder. Mr. Hikar detects movement in the upper right corner of his viewfinder and pans the camera towards it. The hollow grinding sound is that of his tripod. 
A cluster of unknowns are above the three below. Somebody jumps. The cameraman is overcome with excitement with the massive aerial display. And he should be. For the first time ever, a camcorder has recorded daylight footage of an armada of unidentified flying objects over a major metropolis. Note. The two objects above the AM reading on the screen will merge and reappear as three. Also note the gravitational interaction they display with each other. There appeared to be 17 to 23 of these objects of the same image. Uh, we grabbed a single frame as he tilted the camera up. Um, we stopped with one, two, three, four, five prominently visible in the picture. If we go in and zoom on this one here in the middle, we see our hockey puck shape. We get a little more information up here. This object had more than four scan lines on the original camera. We can see at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine and ten up here. Let's just take this area here and take the color information out. Let's enhance the contrast. Now we can go take a, a look at it and see if, if they appear, if any more things appear to us. Now we get the idea of what the normal sky should look like at this point. And the object here doesn't appear to show any atmospheric disturbance or anything around it. Helicopters, things like that would. This object doesn't appear to be moving very fast at all. It's not emitting any great amount of heat because uh, the heat waves are pretty apparent when you get into this type of thing that we're doing with the computer here. There's the other one. It's almost like they're fading in and out. If we were to take and release, say, four white balloons up in the sky and let them float up, you'd expect to see all four of them look very similar. They'd all have the same intensity and whatever. Uh, there's no real explanation for four balloons being in the sky, one showing to the camera with contrasts like this and other ones like this, unless this one was way in the distance. Okay. However, the size of this object is the same as these. The other problem we had with it being balloons is if all of these were just floating up in the sky, then the direction of motion would be vertical. They would all be fairly symmetrical. They wouldn't, they wouldn't change relative to position to each other as they floated up. When we look at the live video, several of the objects appear to move up and down. Some of them go side to side and, and do a side to side motion, and the others don't move at all. Uh, so if this one is floating up and this guy starts moving horizontally and then stops, um, it kind of dispels the balloon theory. As the new year approached, the OVNIs continued their march through the skies over Mexico. From valleys and from rooftops, camcorders in hand, the people of Mexico continue to document and witness the most astounding UFO events in history.
Este sí se ve perfecto. On New Year's Day, the OVNIs came calling. The first recorded sighting was at 2 p.m. The suspense builds as two more OVNIs are clocked over the city at 3.51 p.m. And 5.21 p.m. By now, the city was ablaze with excitement. People stopped in the streets to observe the aerial displays. Traffic backed up on Avenida Reforma, the major thoroughfare, as people abandoned their vehicles to watch the unknowns hovering over their city. Even the police were mesmerized. Entire families were drawn into the unfolding drama. Some registered disbelief, others awe. At 6 p.m., the unknowns were still visible. They had now been over Mexico City for four hours. The following day, major newspapers carried detailed articles. The photographs were riveting. There was also photographs of the OVNIs. Major newspapers carried headline stories of how the OVNIs had greeted the new year above the capital city of Mexico. One headline read, Amazement of the people living in the capital after the presence of three assumed UFOs. Another, expectation in the large city for the UFOs, and still, astonishment, UFOs in the sky. And finally, expectation for strange objects in the sky of the capital. On one New Year's Day, Mexico had lost their age of innocence. And today, the population of Mexico is faced with a choice that the United States confronted during the summer of 1952. In July of that year, 14 unidentified flying objects made low-level passes over the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Tracked by radar, the initial reaction was to scramble fighters. But when the Air Force jets entered the same sector as the unknowns, the unknowns would vanish from the radar screens. Then they would reappear later. And this went on and on in a bizarre game of hide and seek. The following day, the White House and Pentagon were flooded with phone calls. Major newspapers headlined the story on the front page. And under the insistent demands from the nation's press, and accumulating pressure from the public, the chief of staff set up a press conference at the Pentagon. Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation, since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. 
We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage. And that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. This would be the first and last official press conference held by a United States government representative on the subject matter of unidentified flying objects. Like Washington, D.C. in 1952, the airspace above the capital of Mexico and the surrounding areas have been inundated by unidentified aircraft. To date, the officials and citizens of Mexico have not found it necessary to attack what they did not understand. And we can only hope that in the future, they will continue to demonstrate the courage that is necessary to have an open mind.